Assalamualaikum and good evening everyone. Uh, I'm Hafsa, I'm the chairperson of CME Met Titmai and today uh, we're at the seventh uh, session of CME uh, organized by Met Titmai uh, and we're honored actually because we're doing this in collaboration with the medical education department, uh, faculty of medicine uh, UKM. And uh, we have uh, our radiologist uh, today, Dr. K. Kamal, who is on the uh, chest x-ray interpretation made easy. But before that, I would like to just um, uh, express my appreciation to my excellent team. So uh, uh, we, I have the co-chairs uh, present uh, today, uh, Dr. Iskandar Mirza and Dr. Norman, uh, both uh, very enthusiastic in uh, teaching. And we have also the um, uh, committee, Dr. Rafida Abdullah, uh, Mr. Zainal Adwin, Dr. Rafida Sohana, Dr. Anwar Fazal, and Dr. Nurul Yakin. All of them are full of fantastic ideas. And uh, this is the seven CME, but I cannot believe how fast we're learning and growing. And as you all know, we had a session last week uh, with YB Kari Jamaluddin, and it was an excellent session. And I'm thrilled to see that uh, a lot of people benefit uh, from that session. And I hope we can continue this effort uh, to uh, continue uh, educating and uh, providing reliable medical information and support our medical fraternity uh, to um, uh, grow their medical knowledge and skills through these sessions. So um, without further ado, uh, I would like to invite uh, Dr. K. Kamal uh, she will be sharing her slides and uh, you, you also see her image on the side um, for her presentation. So uh, I would like to uh, kindly ask everyone to unmute their mic uh, to make sure that there's no interruption during the session. Um, without further ado, I would like to welcome Dr. K. Kama. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and good evening everyone. So today I'll be sharing about chest x-ray interpretation um, made Easy, not really, but almost easy, but yeah, we'll try. Okay. Right, can you see? So we have to go back to basics. The first thing you have to know is within the past seven days in my hospital itself, for 432 out of 1,050 x-rays are chest x-rays, meaning that chest x-rays are the bulk of uh, x-ray examination uh, usually done uh, in any uh, centers. So what are the indications for these chest x-rays? Usually we do them for infections such as TB pneumonias, carcinomas, chirurgical mediastinal mass, trauma, to see, to see rib fractures, pneumothorax, hemothorax, and also for pre-op assessment. So <clears throat> we can also see uh, cardiac and pulmonary investigations to see cardiomegaly and signs of heart failure, as well as congenital abnormalities um, uh, of the heart and also the vessel. And also for us to check for tube placement such as central line, uh, nasogastric tube and all. So the first thing you have to know is there's actually two main positioning that we do for our uh, chest x-rays, which is the PA and also the AP. So the PA means that the uh, beam comes from posterior to the anterior. And AP on the other hand is the beam from the anterior to the posterior. It is more favorable for us to read um, x-rays that are done in the PA because it is um, more representative of the um, original size uh, of the heart and gas than a massage. Uh, the PA is usually um, safe for people who cannot uh, stand up straight or uh, must, meaning that they are maybe, um, they must take it in supine position, semi-erect or um, erect in sitting position. So um, the Different positioning will affect the medicine structures, the rotation, inspiration, and also the magnification of the heart. So uh, these are the difference between the PA view and also the AP view. Uh, as you can see, this is the, the one that we are so used to, the PA view. This is our normal chest x-ray, looking really normal. And this is actually still a normal chest x-ray, but because it's an AP portable view, a few things um, look different, like the heart looks bigger and <clears throat> The what they call it, the hyla um, vasculature looks more crowded because of um, the positioning. And if you notice over here, um, the the scapula is at the periphery of the lung field, so it doesn't get too much into the lung fields as compared to this one. So it will give us a clearer view of the lung fields in the PA view. <clears throat> 
So how do we appraise a good chest X-ray? For us to um, read a good chest X-ray, we must know what constitute a good chest X-ray because when a chest X-ray is not good enough, we can reject it, do not read it, and repeat it if needed. So the first thing we have to have is good inspiration in which the six anterior coastal arches are seen. So this is how you calculate the anterior coastal arches. So from the back, one, two, three, four, okay, like that. So the six anterior coastal arches, it's supposed to intersect at this uh, mid-clavicular line at the mid of the diaphragm. And sym symmetrical procreation of the thorax means that you have almost symmetrical, um, meaning that it's not rotated. Visible vascular uh, pattern of the lung, such as here, meaning that it's not over or under penetrated. Visibility of the trachea, the bronchi, heart borders, these are the heart borders, su suitable density and contrast, and we're supposed to be able to see the retrocardiac structures. And then uh, with a suitable sharpness, meaning the patient didn't move, and suitable collimation. Collimation means that the way you cut it, you didn't accidentally cut the CP angle, or you cut it too big that you can see the half of the abdomen as such. So um, rotated position in the AP radiograph um, can also uh, play a lot of role because it creates a lot of confusions for people, especially when they see a rotated X-ray and they thought that it's actually a pathology. Like this one is rotated and you see as if um, the <coughs> structures at the right um, paraspinal region too, <coughs> it looks like a lobulated bit, but actually it's because of the rotation such as this as well. So we must make sure that the rotation is uh, ideally, uh, the, it is not rotated. So how do we know that the patient is not rotated? So this is the medial end of the clavicle and this is our spinous process of the vertebra. So it should be about equidistant. So when it's about equidistant and we can say, yes, it is not rotated and we can start reading it. Um, meaning if you see some abnormalities, it might be abnormality. And an inspiration, like I mentioned just now. You see, this is a good inspirational um, image and this is a under-inspired image. So we see that <clears throat> the heart looks bigger than it's supposed to. The crowding of the vessels is more. Um, so sometimes it can give you the wrong impression on what the patient is having when actually you're just dealing with a normal chest X-ray. So like I said just now, the inspiration ideally is the sixth anterior intercostal space or 10 posterior. So you calculate anteriorly, one, two, following the arch. But if you calculate posterior, just you put your posterior in one, two, three, as such. And uh, this is the thing that you have to understand about x-rays. Once an x-ray <coughs> beam um, falls on the x-ray film, uh, it will have different attenuation depending on what is filtered in between. Meaning that if you have metal, then you will see it really, really white. If you have air, then you see it really black. So, and in between, so you have bone, which is whitish gray uh, and so on. So you need to have x-rays with good penetration as well. If it's too over penetrated, you won't see a thing because the lung will be too black for you to, <clears throat> to uh, what do you call it? To interpret. And if it's under penetrated as well, you won't be able to see uh, the retrocardiac region uh, or, <clears throat> or the, um, below the diaphragm region, which usually will have some pathology, you might miss them. So we move on to pathology of the lung. So you, usually pathology of the lung, you we differentiate it into two types, which is the alveolar disease, which is the airways. Uh, like this is the terminal, the terminal unit of the lungs, which are the alveolar, alveolus, alveolar. So <clears throat> whenever these alveolus, they're supposed to be filled with air. So whenever something is filled with air in an X-ray, you will see it as black. But if it's filled with some form of fluid, doesn't matter what kind of fluid, pus, blood, proteinaceous fluid, it will be whitish. So um, if it's <clears throat> just a small bit uh, of the alveolar, uh, what do you call that, the alveolar tissues that got involved, then you will just find some fluffy, fluffy things. But if that one whole unit, like a bunch of them uh, got... <clears throat> Uh, what they call that, uh, has had a disease with the fluid inside. So you will be able to see like the whole thing getting consolidated. And <clears throat> like this image, the, it is consolidated with airborne programs within. And then we have the interstitial disease. Interstitial means that the ones need, the red ones, the ones supporting it. 
such as the alveolar wall. So usually when there's an interstitial disease, we differentiate it into a reticular type or a nodular type or a reticular nodular type. Meaning that this reticular is like a garis lah. And then nodular is the dot dot dots. So you can have a combination of both. So like in this case, we have the reticular types, mostly reticular types. And then the hilum. So in this uh, images, I'm showing you bilateral hyla enlargement in this image. And in this one, unilateral hyla enlargement. You see, um, this is a very basic um, lecture that I'm giving. If I go in depth, it will be a long uh, lecture. So the hilum itself is a topic on its own. And inshallah, we'll be uh, tackling that more in the advanced, um, advanced one later. Uh, we'll schedule that later. So <clears throat> the causes of unilateral and bilateral usually are as such that we have infections, tumor, and vascular causes. And we have bilateral such as uh, sacrodosis also can be due to infection, tumor, and vascular causes. Uh, some of the time, we are not able to differentiate whether it is a... <clears throat> whether it is a vascular or is a lymph node because sometimes they can look so lobulated that you cannot differentiate them anymore. So uh, that one usually we will still move on to another higher level um, investigation such as the CT scan and the diaphragm. So the diaphragm, the right side must always be higher than the left because the liver is pushing it. If there is any pathology, uh, like elevation of the hemidiaphragm, we will see that the right is either two centimeters more. It's, this is two centimeters, right? But if suddenly the right is more than two centimeters, like four centimeters more than the um, left hemidiaphragm, then we should think there must be, there could be something down here or up here to cause that. And if the left suddenly became equivalent to the right, then that's an elevation of the left hemidiaphragm that we should um, start. Um, be suspicious of something. So these are the causes such as the above the diaphragm, on the diaphragm, and below the diaphragm, the causes of elevated hemidiaphragm. So it could be because uh, like above, what caused the diaphragm to be elevated? If we think logically, it must be because of the lung volume has decreased. It doesn't matter due to what, whether the patient had atelectasis or collapse or probably had some uh, pneumonectomy or is born with pulmonary hypoplasia. And in trauma, we have diaphragmatic rupture or rib fracture causing splinting or uh, maybe uh, eventration of hernia, nerve palsy. And if it's below, sometimes we can have the subclinic type of information such as pericarditis or abscess causing <clears throat> and also increase of the abdominal volume causing um, the diaphragm to be pushed up. So how do we approach the chest x -ray? There are many approaches actually. It really depends on you. If you if you read enough chest x-rays, eventually you will find an approach on your own um, because it's actually very individualized. But there are a few ways of doing it. One, you can do the inside-out approach, right? You start from the heart and you go to the mediastinum, the hilar, the lungs, the rest of the world, and then you go to the abdominal so that you don't miss anything. That's another way for you to just you see the abnormality first, such as you see, okay, there's a consolidation. So what's the pattern? Such as the uh, the consolidation is um, global consolidation with elbow program. And then you come with a differentiated diagnosis. Oh, this could be um, when it's the consolidation, you think of a mesh or you think of a pneumonia, but because there's elbow program, you think of a pneumonia, so such as that. And um, of course, you have to, um, like we always say, correlate clinically. That's why whenever you want to report a chest X-ray, it's very important for the primary team to give us the story because without the story, we're just making guesses and I'm looking at the wall just as much as you are. So we also have the ABCG, ABCDEFG kind of system, like the airway, the bones, bones, and then the cardiac, the uh, E effusion, D diaphragm, F fields, lung fields, uh, so this is what, whenever you have an airway, you come in at the tracheal position, the deviation, the bones, and cardiac silhouette, the size, diaphragm, and the gastric bubble, the pleural space, the lung fields, whether there's consolidation, atelectasis, or collapse, and also the great vessels. And this is just another image of um, that, you know, uh, ulangan. So but whatever it is, whatever that you do, whatever system that you have, the first thing you have to remember is do not ignore the elephant. 
if you see something so strikingly abnormal, please do not leave that. Mention that first and then come back to the rest of the system because it only looks logical that you do that. So <clears throat> we describe the lungs in the chest x-ray according to zones. The zones doesn't mean that these are, <clears throat> what's the word? It doesn't represent the lobes. It just represents the zones. Because if you really want to know lobes, um, the CT scan would be the most, um, what do you call that, accurate for that. So how do we give, uh, how do we bahagikan the three lobes? So we go to the upper zone, the middle zone, and the lower zones in which the three anterior ribs are calculated. And then you make a line, the next three, and then you make a line. So that's how we um, divide them into these three lobes, I mean zones. Okay, and then we have to know about hyla point. <clears throat> this hyla point, this, you see this, this um, V, uh, the V chip thing. Okay, these hyla point is a normal structure. You should have this because it's, this is actually the structure in which the upper pulmonary lobe, the uh, upper pulmonary lobe vein, the upper pulmonary lobe vein here intersects with the lower pulmonary lobe artery. So the vein is here and the artery is here. And when they intersect, they have this hyalur point. And if you see the left hyalur point, it's almost inevitably higher than the left by at least 95% of the population because the left um, pulmonary artery crosses the left bronchus on top of it. So that's why it is higher. So when you see that there's the hyalur enlargement, like lobulation, like a focal mass, or there's an increase in density, the density should be about similar and um, you lost the convexity, then something is not right at the high limit. And this is the pleura. If you don't see the pleura, you're safe, meaning that there's nothing going on with the pleura because a normal pleura, they just, they will just um, approximate each other. It's a potential space between the visceral pleura and the uh, medicinal visceral pleura and the, I forgot the name of the other one, never mind. <clears throat> But whatever it is, if you don't see the pleura, the pleura is out here. This is the outline of the pleura. If you don't see it, then it's normal. But if you see there's some um, wavy thing over here, or there's some blunt thing, uh, or, or there's some, you know, anything on the pleura, like, uh, like a large thingy. So when the pleura is seen, that's when it is abnormal. And this is the costophrenic angle, or only known as the CT angle. So the CP angle must be sharp bilaterally. That's why I say the collimation, whenever there's an X-ray done, you must make sure that both CP angles are included because sometimes even a slight blunting, um, a slight blunting is also very important because whenever there's a slight blunting, it means that the patient has a pleural effusion of at least 200 ml. So uh, be wary. The first thing you have to do is to make sure that the X-ray is acceptable. Baru you boleh baca. Okay, and the diaphragm that I mentioned just now, and the cardiothoracic ratio, how do we calculate? Using um, pomaris centimeters, we calculate from the lateral, uh, lateral of the biggest lateral wall of the biggest diameter of the chest wall. And then you bahagikan, you know, and then this one, you bahagikan this one. This one, the heart, ni, you bahagikan. And then if you get more than 0 0.6, we're giving, uh, this is usually in an uh, PA view tau. Kalau AP view tu, sometimes kita akan inspired. It can give you a false impression. So again, correlate clinically. So zero, more than 0 0.6 <coughs> is cardio thoracic ratio of a cardiomegaly. Lah. And then these are the media standard contour, a normal contour that you should be familiar with because any of losses in this contour uh, can mean something. So like this one, I will show you. Okay, this one is the paratracheal stripes, superior vena cava, and then this is superior vena cava. It's cavo atrial junction. This is already right atrium. This bulge over here, and this is already the bulge of the inferior vena cava. And then over here, this is our arch of aorta, or like you love to say, aortic knuckle. This is the main pulmonary artery, the auricle of the left atrium, and this is left ventricle. This is the left ventricle, and some in some patients you see this. This is a normal fat pack. Um, sometimes we see this and they got so alarmed and they were asked for a CT scan um, to rule out mass or mediastinal mass. But if you see this and this, if you notice the cardiac shadow 
and the fat patch shadow. Do you notice that the cardiac shadow is slightly whiter than here? This is because this is the fat. So usually it's not alarming to us. Uh. I hope it's not alarming to you by now. Why is it so important like I mentioned just now? Because this is called the silhouette sign. Silhouette to it means scan. Because when you take an x-ray, it is um, the chest wall has so many things. It has the lung, the mediastinum, and everything in the bones. So everything will be packed into one 2D when you image. So when it's packed to a 2D image, we have to understand that what image is what so that you know that, okay, this is normal and this is not normal. So silhouette, loss of silhouette actually, uh, um, meaning that this is the normal silhouette of the, you can normal silhouette of the diaphragm. But if you lose it, such as this, you lose it. You don't see the normal silhouette of the diaphragm. You call it loss of contour of the diaphragm. So this could be like number one, let me go number one. Number one, you lose the uh, left heart border. So this is indicative of a lingula disease, meaning the lingula segment of the left uh, upper lobe. And similarly, on the hemidiaphragmy, if you lose it here, it's a lower lobe, right lower lobe in your lung disease, or upper left. <clears throat> Both pun will have hemidiaphragm when you um, uh, loss of control. And the paratracheal stripe, such as paratracheal disease, this is a topic on its own. And the chest wall, my chest wall here, like I said just now, when you don't see the pleura is normal, you see something on the pleura, then it could be a pleural disease or a rib disease, then you have to look closely whether the rib is eroded, like that. And similarly, um, if we have like a aortic knuckle um, control loss, it could be an anterior mediastinal or a left lobe disease, like a paraspinal line here. You see this one at the back? Three quarters of the time, you don't even see it. Yes, this one is important because it might, uh, it might um, indicate a posterior mediastinal disease. And here, the right heart border is a middle lobe disease, indicating of a middle lobe disease. It doesn't matter, maybe it's a uh, mask, maybe it's a consolidation. And the thing that you must, must remember is the hidden areas because you tend to miss this. You've seen everything and you just, you just forgot to see the, that wow, the apex actually got mass or the hyalazone actually got lobulation or the um, retrocardia actually got consolidation or maybe the zone below the diaphragm. Sometimes a uh, patient comes with, um, uh, what do you call it? Abdominal pain, first kita ambil lah x-ray kan? And turn out to be, we can see macam, in the liver punya, uh, area, we can see macam air, 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 and turn out to be patient to actually had a liver abscess. So you must have a look at here as well. And here lah, the subcastic bubble. So I'll go to a few cases. Okay, so this is, eh? so this is a unilateral white out lung. So whenever you have a unilateral white out lung, oh, this is almost white out lung. Why out ni meaning that putih lah. Uh, you don't know what happened to the lung. So you, in order for you to know, you must, uh, you must ascertain whether it's a volume loss kind of white out or it's a mass effect kind of white out. So how do you know? Like in this case, you see this trachea is like pulled. So whenever it's pulled, and you see where the heart hilang sudah. So whenever it's pulled, means that there must be some form of hilangan. So the volume is lost. So in this case, you see some residual lungs. So it must be some form of collapse. So when it's collapsed, it becomes some sort of a vacuum in the left hand, uh, the right hand diaphragm. So it just sucks everything towards that side. So this could be because of a collapse. Huh? And then this one, it is pushed to the other side. And you see the heart, everybody is like uh, moving to the left, um, upper left hemithorax. So this is, it means that something is pushing. So something is pushing by what? It could be a mass along with a, a huge mass along with a pleural effusion causing the push. So um, that's why you need to see why that's the unilateral uh, white outline is because of what. I mean, yes, you can always do a CT scan, but it's nice to read, you know. And if you see, what if you see a unilateral white out, tapi dia punya media standard tak gerak. It's just smack in the middle nicely, like normal. So you have to think of there must be a component of both. There must be some form of collapse with some form of efficient like that. So it must, and then it equalizes. So that's how the you know, thought process goes. And then we have um, like contoh lung lesions of mass. So this is a, an abscess, like usually very huge abscess, thick wall, cavity thing lesion with air fluid level. And then this one, 
Uh, if you see this one, it's the upper lobe pneumonia. Because you see this consolidation, and then you see that that um, macam halus halus punya uh, grey grey color tu. That is the airborne program. Meaning that is an alveolar type of. I mean, it's a yes, alveolar type of disease, an airway type of disease. And this one is a mass. So the mass might be originating from the lung because the tengah tengah, and then it takkan show hilum here. You see the hilum sign. The hilum is still there. Okay. And then pulmonary tuberculosis. In Malaysia, TB is like the most rampant. So we must at least know something about TB. And TB can come like um, in various presentations. So in PTB, they have a primary PTB and a post-primary PTB. Primary PTB ni maknanya dia kena first time lah. Post-primary dia pernah kena datang balik, something like that. So um, we can have different uh, presentations. Usually in 95% unilateral lymph node enlargement yeah, especially in children. You just see on the hilum, the tiba besar macam tu. Just that. And then sometimes we have low effusion and sometimes we see small area of consolidation. And occasionally if it's, kalau katakan dia kena TB sekali bad, then it will have a consolidation that is extensive lah. So we have post primary TB, it could have consolidation plus minus cavitation. This is the hallmark. And usually this kekacau dekat apical for some reason, the gone focus love to be in the apical region. So but I think the apical region when you're barring that it is most dependent. Okay, so these are various um, phases of PTB. So you have like this one, right upper zone, you see that? The right upper zone, it has consolidation. It has consolidation and then it has prominent right hilum. If you compare these two, this one looks more white. Then this one, it has multiple coalescent as space nodules in the upper zones. It becomes nodules ramai -ram -ram -ram. Why I say coalescent means that they are assassin nodules. Initially, it was nodules like blah, 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 blah. And then finally, when they get together ramai -ram -ram, they they coalesce, they form a group and it becomes more, more what do you call that? Coalescing, huh? Like more ramai -ram -ram like that. And this one, maybe it's quite hard to see. It's actually miliary TB. I have a better image to make next. And this one is a active post-primary TB. Um, as you can see up here, you see that a FICA consolidation and inside that's this um, cavity and the fibrosis surrounding it. Loss of volume because uh, you can see that this is actually the upper lobe. And it's like a little The high, apa? the um, oblique fissure punya, uh, the oblique fissure punya line to so the tarik atas sikit. And then you can see scattered nodules and also the lymph node from apa? Um, nampak more prominent and over here we can see loculated coefficient see this coefficient how they just duduk the endem gets two and then with many s place nodules nodules ni like I said dot 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 okay and this is uh, yang gambar tadi yang I said nampak tu miliary TB miliary TB ni it indicates a hematogenous spread of infection meaning that the TB is usually this uh, kind of TB is even more, what's the word? The prognosis is even poorer, lah, meaning that it TB could have one So it comes from hematogenous strep. Probably it doesn't start from the uh, lung, but eventually it goes to the lung. So we describe this as numerous tiny nodules of about one to three mm uniform in size and distribution. If you want to talk about military TB. Um, but you have to understand that miliary nodules, not only TB, there are many differential lain, but since I'm talking about TB, this is miliary TB, this is how it looks like. Okay, so this is active pulmonary TB. You find this um, right upper lobe in a thick cavitating wall, a thick, thick cavitating region, thick wall cavitating region, the surrounding consolidative changes. So the punya wall is thick, and then at the beginning the consolidation. Okay, and then we have this one. Uh, this one just presenting as right high lymph neuropathy, which is primary TB. No, there are no other changes. So, but like, okay, man, the perfusion, the nodules, the consolidation, just this. So, be wary, especially in the primary, uh, primary care, kan? Uh, there are always what the TB thing is screening. So, be wary of um, high lymph neuropathy as the as the first sign of primary TB. And in this one, you can see right apical consolidation with evidence of volume loss. You can see this volume loss because you see the trachea, the tarik ke sana, and then this upper lobe bronchus, the upper, uh, again, the tarik, 
So um, these are like, um, what do you call that? Uh, evidence of volume loss. Like you see the grapes got crowded in comparison to the other. So this is a post-primary TB. So the trendiest thing in the world, COVID-19. You have to understand one thing. COVID-19, eh, a normal chest x-ray, it doesn't exclude it. If you have a normal chest x-ray, but the RTK uh, or PCR is positive, you must still say that RTK positive, uh, a normal chest x-ray doesn't uh, correlate with, uh, doesn't, uh, normal chest x-ray does not exclude COVID-19 infection, kindly correlate with PCR. You might be very irritated reading us writing that, but that's just how it is because we cannot exactly check up normal. We must have some form of disclaimer. Even if you see in our TB punya screening, and sometimes you hand over to us, we will say normal chest x-ray. However, 30% of PTB will present with normal chest x-ray like that. So there's no single picture of COVID pneumonia that is actually specific or diagnostic, but we have a few patterns to suggest that this patient is having COVID-19. Uh, usually it's a single, it's a combination of multi-focal peripheral lung changes, peripheral lung changes, peripheral lung changes, and it comes, uh, it's either a GGO with it, meaning that the ground glass, ground glass is like glass cupboard. Have you seen any? With glass to they tak berapa clear. Macam orang mandi tu, uh, you see it that way, the glass cupboard. Ataupun consolidation, consolidation like we see yang betul-betul putih tu lah. And most commonly is bilateral presence. So we are victims of this one patient. This one is the normal baseline X-ray. They could, uh, I mean, it's not normal. They are positive dah. Tapi this is day zero. So during day zero, uh, sorry, sorry, this is normal x-ray taken before, tak tahulah bila-bila. Maybe he has a baseline x-ray prior. This is taken at day zero during his ED admission. So what we see is, um, ada GGO ni lah, GGO kat periphery, uh, GGO. Ni semua GGO yang putih-putih ni, uh, GGO or consolidation, consolidative changes. Uh, it's not wrong for us to say. So actually GGO tu sepatutnya used in CT, but somehow they use in um, COVID juga. And you see this linear thing, it could be a subsegmented atelectasis as well. And then, this is day 10. Usually when patients with COVID admitted, kan, dia paling teruk day 10 to day 12. So uh, a day 10, uh, especially when the patient is deteriorating, is a good time for us to take another x-ray. So in this x-ray, you see that the patient has gotten sicker. He's intubated, lah, other, other central line, semua, other nasogastric tube. So it shows progression of the um, overall progression lah because the uh, apa, the GGO tadi tu dah makin menggila. Uh, dia more coalescing with each other. You see more of them. And then tadi apa dekat retrocardiac region tu pun dah makin nampak. And then the apa here you can still see that uh, there is what um, the left atrium and uh, the left ventricle punya outline really nice kan. CD dah makan meaning it has already um, taken more areas um, of the lung. Lah. Okay, and in this uh, image, pula, okay, um, this is a normal image to compare if the patient has a baseline. And then this one has bilateral, dense, peripheral, nampak? mostly got the P. Consolidation and loss of lung markings, especially in the mid and lower zones. The P is many mid, upper, punya juga lah. Because actually, COVID 19 punya, punya, what they call that, punya pattern. Yeah, the, the diffuse pattern and the more peripheral pattern. So this is heading to the diffuse pattern. Okay, plural abnormality. So uh, like I said, if you don't see the plural, you're safe. Tapi dalam case ni, you see that this, there's a plural. So much in this case, uh, plural abnormality is plural efficient. Plural abnormality ni, it could be because of the plural having a mass, atau ada fluid, atau ada air. So in this case, this is a proliferation where you usually call the meniscal sign. And then uh, this one is a plural uh, pneumothorax. Pneumothorax, ni, the first thing you have to see, there's no lung markings. If you see this one, there must be some vascular markings. You must have vascular markings. This is a crazy huge pneumothorax that I'm showing you. But if you... Uh, whenever you see an X-ray, please see kat hujung-hujung sini. Ha, usually di hujung-hujung je. Suddenly you see another extra line and then di sini hitam sikit. Then you have to be very wary, especially patients who you highly suspect macam uh, MVA patients ke. And this is the collapsed lung. This one memang besar lah if you miss it. Mm, not supposed to miss it. 
Okay, and this one, uh, CCF punya, eh, CCF pada, um, cardiomegaly lah. Like I told you, uh, this is a normal chest x-ray, you take the cardiothoracic ratio. Uh, ni yang fat-fat I mentioned to you just now, see? Uh, ni sama bubble eh, tolong jangan ingat benda ni, air and death zone. I tak ada pula eh, gambar air and death zone. <coughs> so, uh, this one pula is a cardiomegaly. If you calculate the... Um, the cardiothoracic ratio is more than 0 0.6 and then other secondary signs lagi the patient is uh, having a pacemaker and then other uh, uh, pro effusion lagi so it overall gives uh, nila macam heart failure kind of patient lah but not in not in um, APO uh, yang ni in APO so actually APO kan acute form already ada tiga stages tau tapi let's just jump to the stage yang yang dah teruk lah uh, this is the alveolar edema stage so in the alveolar edema stage uh, you can see this uh, yellow, yellow, yellow punya ni. Okay. You have this very high consolidation. You see this bilateral very high consolidation. You see that the, the blackish white, uh, the blackish one line too. That is our airborne program. And then <clears throat> we have the pleural fluid, meaning the effusion lah juga. And uh, prominent azygous vein kat sini. Uh, and then also with cardiomegaly. And, after, uh, and again, you still have to compare with patients in the baseline, post-treatment, and you have to also know the history. And post-treatment, tada, really nice. The patient is responding. Ah. And this is for people yang suka sangat curly B, curly B, yang may I tunjuk curly B ke apa. So this is normal x-ray, tak nampak kan? So this is our curly B. So curly B ni actually happens starting from the second stage, which is the interstitial stage of the pulmonary edema. Maksudnya edema tu, Dia dah mula leaking to the interstitium. Kan ada cakap kan interstitium tu apa? The supporting structure of the alveolus ni semua tu kan? So yes, dia dah leak kat sini. So they are seen as short horizontal lines near the plural punya chest wall atau hujung-hujung ni. Sometimes you might not see it especially when they have gone to the next level lah which is the alveolar edema. <coughs> but sometimes they can overlap the second stage going to the third stage and you will be able to see this curly edema. And lastly, this is, um, like I mentioned just now, that one of the indications is for us to see malposition tubes. So this is one. Then this is the nasogastric tube. It's supposed to go all the way down, sampai ke, <coughs> sampai ke, at least if you don't see it uh, masuk ke dalam the stomach bubble pun, you, you can mention traversing down uh, the hemidiaphragm and the tip is not seen, probably in the, in the apa, probably in the abdomen, macam tu lah. Tapi in this case, nak nampak sangat, it loops up. So, apa, this is uh, malposition lah. So, you have to betulkan lah. Oh, kalau you tak sedar juga, kata kalau tak sedar, usually when we notice, we will call lah. Uh, please, betulkan you punya nasogastric tube is not in the right place like that. And this one is the, naso, uh, the EPP. Over lah pula, termasuk dekat sebelah kanan. So, you see the whole of the left lung got collapsed. Sebab there's no aeration. Okay, so I would like to thank these two friends of mine. So long I got slide juga. My slide got corrupted midway. They helped me out. And these are my references. Um, if you are interested to read, there's quite um, a lot of them. Tapi a radiology assistant, radiophidia, and the chest x-ray survival guide is um, the most basic. Lah. So thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Kamal, uh, radiologist, for the excellent presentation. Everyone, I think, is so focused because we heard a lot from you. Um, and uh, we have a few questions already uh, lined up. Uh, I would like to uh, hand over this, uh, the next uh, slot uh, for Q&A to uh, Dr. Iskandar Mirza. Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Afsa. Okay, well done, Dr. K. Your presentation is very good. Okay, now we have uh, some few questions from the audience. Huh? So the first one is uh, from Norkai. Assalamualaikum, doctor. How do we describe fibrosis in chest X-ray? Okay, Assalam. As I mentioned just now, fibrosis is usually uh, a type of airway. It's a type of interstitium. So fibrosis happens in the interstitium. So in interstitium, kita punya, apa, kita punya description goes reticular or nodular or reticular nodular. So fibrosis is usually reticular. So we can say multiple reticular um, opacities seen at where uh, and usually fibrosis will come with ada beradik dia ialah collapse uh, bukan collapse but volume loss because dia dah tak boleh nak expand kan. So we kata with um, evidence of volume loss uh, such as uh, yang I said just now lah 
nampak rib crowding you can see dia punya uh, oblique fissure tu naik as, as such yes okay thank you very much uh, the next question will be from divya good evening doctor how to identify cardiomegaly in ap view in ap view hmm. <coughs> actually 0.6 so is a is a apa bagi is a um uh what's the word objective way of saying it tapi sometimes when you eyeball and you see secondary signs especially macam you nampak ada like i said it's not ada fluid fusion pasal patient you datang memang ada unsur-unsur macam nak failure then you can almost um confidently say that this could be cardiomegaly Hmm. Okay. Uh, next question from Dr. AJ. Eh. This one, uh, actually, uh, this person was asking whether, what is GGO? Ground glass opacity, sayang. Uh, ground glass opacity, okay. Yeah, eh. I said some ground glass tu, yeah. I said glass kabut yang macam orang mandi nampak sikit tu. That, that right. kind of glass. Okay. Now another one is uh, from Yumi. Eh. Yumi, hi doctor. How do we differentiate fibrosis, bronchitis and collapse lung? Thank you. <laughs> Panjang ni soalan. Panjang. Ah, okay, okay. Um, okay, macam ni. The thing is, bronchiectasis can boleh datang sekali juga dengan fibrosis. So, sometimes they coexist together. So, if you really are interested in knowing the differences, memang kita buat HRCT lah eventually. But, whatever it is, um, in bronchiectasis, we can see the, eh, biasa kita panggil lah, tram track appearance. Dia macam tu. Hmm. Ada macam line tram track appearance, it means like the bronchus tu dia jadi besar tapi tepi dia jadi tebal. So tram track appearance and kalau misalkan kata, that one is kalau kita nampak macam ni. But if the bronchus macam tu, then you see that thick neck ring appearance. Dia nampak macam bulat besar. And usually hmm. itu kat hujung-hujung. Because a bronchiectasis means that an airway that is um, dilated at the hujung-hujung. Kalau kat tengah tu memang, as, of course lah airway dia besar. Hujung-hujung pun mengincik 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 But hmm. if it's still at the hujung near the periphery, you still see it big, then it is a bronchiectasis. Okay. Tapi apa soalan tadi, bronchiectasis? Oh, collapse. Hmm. Collapse. <laughs> And as I mentioned just now, collapse tu boleh datang secondary to um, macam a mucus infection ke, secondary to some kind of uh, apa. Okay, basically collapse dia akan ada the uh, shift of the juga showing volume loss in the features juga. Okay. Okay. Uh, next question is, uh, how do we describe hyperinflated lung feel? Hyperinflated lung feel. Okay. Hmm. Usually hyperinflated lung feel, if yang paling senang lah cara nak tengok. Kalau hmm. you punya heart tu nampak macam menjinjit. Meaning that your heart tu macam tak cukup tempat nak berdiri. Dia jadi hmm. sikit je. Okay, tu eyeballing. Tapi kalau yang betul-betul punya, if it's more than 11 posterior rib, Yes, it's hyperinflation. Actually, hyperinflation is very important, especially in cases of COPD or asthma and cases of pediatric. I didn't mention much about pediatric because pediatric is really totally different. They are, not, they are not little humans, they are actually aliens. So you have to open a different session for them. So, yeah, yeah. Um, so bon uh, in, in fact, I just talk about pendek about the PITS. In fact, if the PITS patient ada nampak hyperinflation, that could also be a sign of uh, apa? Macam the first sign of bronchitis or something like that. So, hmm. you nampak, tapi you nampak heart dia macam, macam tak suka tempat nak menjinjit, no place for it to stand. Dia macam standing at the edge of his toes. Ha, so, hmm. itu eyeballing. Tapi, another one itulah 11. More Ambil. than 11 eh? Okay. Posterior, posterior, canterior. Okay. Next question is from Dr. Alzamani. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> why, why? <laughs> okay. How to differentiate bule versus pneumothorax reliably on chest x-ray? Okay, macam ni. Even in... Even in city pun, it could be very difficult to do that. But if you hmm. apa, if you find kalau bule yang memang bule saja, sometimes you be able to see dia punya demarcation itself. Macam satu bulat, dia dia market. Tapi kalau biasa kata in pneumothorax, apa, you will see that satu line macam tu. But the thing is, having said so, I had this one patient yang memang terkenal ada bule. And bule dia suka nak pecah-pecah for some reason. So hmm. he keeps coming back to us. So every time he keeps coming back, it's usually mesti on call time. And then at that point, they were ask, they ask us for CT scan to differentiate whether it's a bule sahaja or bule that has already ruptured. And honestly, it's actually not easy. And I had to read a few, uh, a few journals that night. So I would say that if you really cannot tell me, buat je lah CT. Hmm, it's okay. okay, we will give the CT, don't worry. Okay. <laughs> okay. Next question from Nurul Hanan. Eh? Okay. This question actually I never practice it, but my, must be the reason that she asked this question. Salam doctor. How to calculate volume of pleural effusion through chest X-ray? Yes. 
Mm. I just got this question and I noticed only the ED will do this. <laughs> uh, so I would like to ask back this question to Dr. Zamani. <laughs> Honestly, because I we just got this uh, question a few days back mm. and it was asked us and all of us, six radiologists were like, huh? we only say like, no more thorax and pali pali pun kita akan kira the depth je. Hmm. Uh, and usually we calculate the depth in the city. Jarang lah dalam x-ray. Pali pali pun kalau nak you just calculate the depth. Meaning the most, the deepest part of the no more thorax from the chest wall. 2 cm, 3 cm. Atau pun we cakap massive no more thorax or just small no more thorax. Macam tu je. Hmm. Okay, okay. So actually it's not a common common thing to be done. Eh? To it's be not done. a common practice uh, in the yeah, radiological yeah. department. So I'm not sure if it becoming a, a more practice in the NILA, uh, in the ED department. So I will read uh, my ED friends in it. Hmm. Okay, okay. Input. Next question from Atika. Huh? Doctor, how do you identify a widening uh, mirastinum? I think mirastinum is one topic on its own. So actually, hmm. There are six. Ah, ni aku sinsing dengan. There are six lines that you need to know in the mediastinum. So among them, elah, and and each of these lines actually ada dia punya signifikan macam the anterior junctional line, posterior junctional line, paraspinal line. The uh, apa lagi ya? Um, ada six lines. I dah tak ingat. So anyway, ada six. So these lines, kalau you see them obliterated. Then you see, okay, kalau katakan paraspinal line obliterated uh, dekat, uh, dekat bawah ni. So probably ada posterior, posterior mediastinum punya mass, uh, mass ataupun something lah, such as a TB spine. You can see kat reka dia ada belak kat belakang tu gemuk tiba-tiba. So actually each of these lines ada dia punya measurement yang boleh diterima. Contohnya right paratracker tu not more than uh, 2mm tak silap. 2mm ke 4mm. So if it's more than that, then you have to suspect something is going on. Hmm. Yeah, like that lah. Tapi, uh, insyaAllah we have a advanced senior course. Uh, tak lah advanced sangat. Tapi more uh, yeah. in terms of x-ray so that we can talk more about this. Because media standard in its own, it's a topic. Yes, okay. Uh, next question from Ilyas. Eh? Salam doktor. You mentioned cardiomegaly being defined as uh, cardiotaxic ratio more than 0.6. Hmm. However, most literature defines as uh, more than 0.5. Can you please elaborate more? Ada yang cakap 0.5, ada yang cakap 0.55, so I take 0.6 tu garanti. Hmm. <laughs> okay, 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 okay. Okay, another one is uh, uh, the same person previously, uh, Dr. AJ. Salam, Dr. Okay. Does curly B-line extra same as B-line in ultrasound? No. Hmm. No, no, I don't eh? think so. Hmm. Sebab okay. uh, extra dengan ultrasound ni dia punya, apa orang panggil? Dia punya uh, cara nak ambil dia pun dah lain. So B-line tu, sekejap, uh, I remember dia. Yeah. Tapi kesimpulannya tak sama lah. You won't be able to see curly B in the ultrasound uh, as a B line. Ha? <laughs> Kalau if, if that helps. Mm, okay. Next question. Uh, this one is more towards I think radiographer. In primary care, we get quite a number of patients with chest X-ray with poor inspiration. How do radiographers usually explain to the patient in order to get good inspiration? <laughs> okay, what our you radiographer usually do? Kita buat practice dulu. Okay, Encik, tarik nafas. Tahan. <laughs> Okay, hmm. lepas, tak nafas, tahan. Do a few practices dulu and then baru patient tu faham. Sampai tu tak faham. Hmm. So, uh, after a few practices and then uh, you'll be able to make uh, make sure that the patient understand. Tentang sebenarnya ada language barrier so make sure that the patient understands. That's number one. So, um, whenever we do macam reject analysis, semua kan boleh tengok patient anda inspired teruk ke apa tu. Memang dia punya tu macam tu. Practice dulu and then baru you ambil gambar. Hmm, okay. Uh, next question from Najia Halufti. Eh. Salam doktor, at what point of time COVID patient require the CT or HRCT? Actually, there's no hard and fast rule because COVID ni kan relatively quite new. It really is depending on the pulmonologist or the infectious disease or the intensivist. Seriously, kalau diorang nak, kita macam, okay. Mm, yes, actually that's true. Eh? <laughs> Based on the clinical uh, clinical assessment, eh? mm. if you don't think it's a, it's a pneumonia, and you think it's other things, then you request uh, to radiologist for CT or HRCT lah. But so, I noticed ada baru punya trend that mm -hmm. right, uh, right before the patient is discharged, especially the patient yang macam teruk-teruk sikit lah, macam category 4A macam tu semua, mm -hmm. they will uh, ask for the recipe lah, will ask for a six, eh, no, four weeks to three weeks post-COVID CT, uh, HRCT to see for fibrosis because in the COVID punya natural, natural apa lagi? progression, mm, yes. eventually, kalau dia teruk sangat, it can go for fibrosis. So, they want to see the extent of the fibrosis in this patient three mm -hmm. weeks post. Uh, I okay. think actually, I didn't study. Tapi... Okay, okay. 
So uh, another one is from Ahmad. Eh? Salam doctor. How do we differentiate between hilum overlay sign and dense hilum sign? Hilum overlay sign and dense hilum sign. Oh, okay. Macam ni. Hilum overlay sign itu meaning that bila ada mass and the mass hilangkan hilum tu, maksudnya the mass tu apa hmm. datang daripada middle-middle sternum. Like I said, middle sternum is a totally different ni. Tapi we can always talk about it just a bit. Hmm. Itu hilum overlay sign. Tapi kalau hilum tu sendiri, eh jap. Kalau hilum tu tak hilang, meaning dia ada mass, tapi hilum tu still nampak, still nampak that that thingy. So it might it might not be from the uh, from the middle middle sternum. Meaning berurut kan daripada hilum tu, it can be from the posterior or the anterior middle sternum, maybe from the lung or something like that. Hmm, okay. We banyak question deh. Yeah, your topic quite hot ah. Okay, actually got another nineteen nineteen lah. Okay, salam doctor. How do we differentiate lung collapse versus lung consolidation? Okay. Uh, Sometimes it's quite hard because collapse boleh datang dengan component of consolidation juga. That's one thing. Tapi uh, kalau you want to be very apa orang panggil, this is consolidation, this is collapse. Usually collapse doesn't have that um, airborne program. Okay. Consolidation usually have, and then hmm. col consolidation usually do not have um, volume loss in your secondary signs like you mentioned. So. Okay, uh, next one. Uh, I think uh, this one from Dr. Nukman. Ke? How do how to differentiate between air and the diaphragm and air in the stomach in chest X-ray? Okay, kalau um, usually kan kalau air in the diaphragm, you must tengok sebelah kanan. I mean kalau patient tu yeah, bukan sizes lah, sizes lah. You must tengok sebelah kanan. Usually dia akan ada in both sides. Kalau dari sebelah dekat, uh, dekat sebelah um, what do you call it? Dekat sebelah stomach dia usually is not. But if you highly highly crazy suspicious, then you can always do a decubitus. Decubitus tu maksudnya Ah, uh, patient tu dia macam tu, and you do a lateral shoot through, and then ah, uh, kira ni patient tu, ah, uh, liver sebelah kanan, right side up, you right side up for about five to ten minutes, no fifteen minutes lah, so that the air has time to go, you insinuate dekat liver and the ni, and you tangkap gambar. Nah, kalau ada tu, then usually ada lah. Okay. That's one way. Okay. Next question is from Wei Ying. Good evening, doctor. How do we differentiate deep sulcus sign from normal costal angle? Uh, angle? Yeah, I tak sebut pak pasal di sulcus sign. Di sulcus sign ni is a sign of um dura, yeah. sign of pneumothorax in patients yang terbaring. So ah uh, compare dengan apa tadi? The punya question dia how do we differentiate between deep sulcus sign from normal costal pangre uh, angle? Oh, okay. Um hmm. usually if you see kan, this is my pengalaman lah because I tak ada uh, apa ma I macam tak ada satu text to tell you this. Tapi basically kalau you nampak kan kiri dengan kanan usually about similar betul tak? Hmm. Dia punya CP angle tu. But if you see one of them apa orang panggil uh, too deep then you have to suspect something. Especially when you really suspect the patient is having something. Hmm. Okay. Next one is from Nur Shahida. Uh, Assalamualaikum and good evening. How to differentiate patient have new hemoneumothorax and lung effusion in chest x-ray? No. You cannot. Hmm. Kena tap eh. You can tap ataupun yeah. kalau you buat uh, apa CT pun sometimes you may not be able to differentiate it too much unless the patient memang bleed dia banyak. Uh, hmm. So that one uh, you can see based on the Hunter value. Tapi uh, in the chest X-ray mostly no. Yeah. Unless tu lah history lah you nampak ada rib fracture. Of course you think of motor apa hemo hemotorax more than perfusion. Hmm okay. Okay, I think that's all. Actually, there's a lot more question, but uh, I want to open to Dr. Rafida. She want to ask one question to you. Oh, benda ni? <laughs> eh, tak ada. Anyway, just, just, uh, anyway, thank you so much, Kay. I think uh, I have, uh, and I mean, radiologists are generally very passionate people. Like. It's just uh, um, clinicians don't engage you all more. Uh, yeah, true. Yeah. Why, why? Uh, no, 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 no. I'm just, I'm just, you know, since we have a lot of people and, uh, you know, a lot of juniors here. A lot, a lot, okay, this is actually a bit controversial, but okay. I want to clear the air. I want to clear the air because I think uh, some of our clinicians are really relatively not happy when uh, radiologists put their correlate clinically right mm -hmm. okay but but i feel uh we should clear the air because i think whenever i see that i will always go down to the radiologist and discuss the case so it's not that you know when you i mean basically from clinician kan kalau kita minta ucit scan you akan uh, you can buat differential as 10 differential according to <laughs> clinically so basically we were like uh, okay 
uh, but which is fair because <laughs> I feel that we should go down and discuss with you and make a, a, a joint decision uh, on what uh, the patient uh, punya possible diagnosis is. Your comment on that. Okay, macam ni. I memang setuju apa you cakap because if you put too many differential diagnosis but eventually I dah tengok dinding, you pun tengok dinding, patient pun tengok yes. dinding, tiga-tiga orang tak nampak apa-apa. So, um, sometimes uh, there are very difficult cases that we prefer that to, to discuss. Sometimes kita punya cerita kat dalam cerita kat dalam apa, uh, uh, kadang-kadang we don't get the EMR macam dalam case uh, hospital I, hospital yang berkomputer kan so we get to read but sometimes we don't get to read uh, apa the VHD and we just know like banyak ni padahal patient may VHD sikit macam baik ni ke you only know this much and sometimes dia punya summary pun macam doesn't make sense so whenever I have to tell you this lah actually whenever we start making 10 differentials we actually face face that <laughs> because kita rasa macam ya Allah dia tak sabar aku ya aku bagi kau 10 lah I, but I have to be honest with you, that's what's happening because um, but I noticed that especially, especially the surgical base they love to come down and discuss with us the so, surgical especially kan diorang nak bila kita cepat so they were like, eh, okay, apa, cerita ni so we would love for the other facilities to come and discuss with us as well because uh, sometimes kan kita macam tak tahu something new sometimes we don't know that what sometimes kan, you macam neuro kan you bagi us 10 signs yang I tak pernah tahu pun benda and I have to sit and read all the 10 signs what does it mean? Oh this actually means apa motor neuron at here. So it's more interest it's more you know helpful if we can you know communicate. I, yeah. I mean I know I know kita duduk dalam gua. I know we like in the dark. <laughs> Tapi we love to be enlightened as well and we love to learn from you. So yeah, yeah let's do that. Yeah yeah I I, the, I think this is uh this is uh, you know, I just need to remind everybody that I usually go down and speak to the doctor. Doctor, I still do So you know, I think I think we shouldn't be. Uh, I think when you write, when you get a report saying that correlate clinically is something wrong with you, asking, uh, you know, you did not number one, you did not ask uh, properly, you did not request and give a full history. Number two, you did not actually discuss the case properly. So actually, the 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 mistake actually is from us, the one who requests. That's my that's my my uh, feeling and my opinion lah you know you can argue with me until the cows come home but last but not least uh, somehow in the place i work uh, there's some uh, some uh, macam famous pula perihyla haziness apa ke benda so perihyla semua orang seem to have perihyla haziness uh, you say, uh... okay so ni uh, actually perihyla haziness tu taklah salah sangat tapi you have to understand one thing at the hilum ada banyak benda dia ada vein dia ada artery so dia ada the apa bronchus going about so dia ada it, it is memang busy lah ada ada notes kalau dia besar you can see it so memang it's a very busy area that very high lah tu tapi some you just have kita ni kena faham lah uh, that very high lah punya region tu dah as it is busy tapi you have to differentiate whether it's a normal busyness macam macam apa uh, highway apa yang selalu jam uh, federal ah. Ah, federal punya jam tu, standard punya jam tu ataupun jam yang sampai lusa tak habis lagi. So, similarly at the very high level tu pun, you can differentiate whether it's, it is a normal jam tu ataupun tiba-tiba dia ada terlebih orang kat situ causing what? Maybe ada accident ke apa, so accident tak kira lah, mass ke, maybe that's a something lah ongoing. So, it's not wrong to use very high level haziness. But dalam case-case macam uh, ATO pun, sometimes the first places that we have the haziness is at the very high level, tepi-tepi high level. Sometimes kita menyampah dengan peri highlight. So kita pakai para highlight. It means the same. <laughs> Tapi <laughs> that's what I mean. It's always busy. You still have to differentiate whether it's busier than usual or not. Hmm. Completely agree. Sebab everybody seems to have peri highlight. Izin. I pun naik. Bila dah sebut tu, I macam apa benda. You know, uh, so that that's my comment. That's all. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna ask anymore. So thank you so much <laughs> for the you. wonderful presentation. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. K. Okay, now I'll get, uh, give the floor to Dr. Tafsa. Right. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Iskandar, and of course, uh, our, our, our presenter, Dr. K. Kamal, for the informative session. Uh, I'm sure we all learn a lot from you, and um, we have a lot of uh, medical practitioners joining us, and uh, we are targeting these sessions for um, a, to, to junior uh, medical doctors and junior workers, but in fact, you know, those, the, the senior doctors are also benefiting from this session. So thank you, Dr. K. Uh, you're you. on many things. 
Um, and, um, saya juga rasa terharu yang ada juga uh, uh, bukan petugas para kesihatan tapi uh, masih sudi uh, bersama kita dalam uh, oh, Thank you. Uh, uh, ada yang uh, buat uh, minta uh, sesi ini dijalankan dalam bahasa Melayu jadi untuk uh, untuk um, uh, sesi ini kita akan jalankan dalam bahasa Inggeris untuk uh, education session tapi Uh, kita memang terbuka kepada cadangan kalau ada uh, cadangan untuk uh, uh, sesi untuk komuniti ataupun masyarakat uh, di luar sana kami terbuka dan kami boleh uh, mungkin accommodate uh, untuk uh, session uh, uh, tertentu uh, tapi uh, minta maaf memang uh, kebanyakannya akan dijalankan dalam bahasa Inggeris supaya uh, mereka boleh uh, uh, apply uh, aplikasi dalam um, uh, uh, kerja seharian okey So um, uh, actually, I just want to tell you as well for the next session, it will be me, uh, myself, who will be de uh, delivering the topic, um, uh, interpretation of uh, skin lesions or description of skin lesions. Um, so uh, same time uh, next week on Sunday at 8.30. Uh, so to those of you who are interested to know on how to describe skin lesions, I know Uh, we learn very little uh, of uh, dermatology in medical school, so I appreciate that. And sometimes if you call dermatology, it's, uh, it's, it is actually uh, quite challenging to describe skin lesions if you're not used to it. So uh, if you're interested, and uh, I think primary healthcare uh, practitioners are also um, used to seeing uh, skin conditions, uh, I would encourage you to come to our session next week. Um, and uh, thank you for your questions. Uh, we have our president and uh, Dr. East who will look, um, uh, keeping an eye on the questions today. Uh, so thank you, Dr. Kari Hafiz and Dr. East. Uh, so um, I'll um, wish everyone good evening for tonight and uh, we'll see you next week. Assalamualaikum.